Introductory Curriculum for Fellows. This program has been designed by Dr. Masoka, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Levine and myself as an eight-week review of the fundamentals of shoulder and elbow surgery. We really hope that everyone listening will learn and enjoy. The topic tonight is shoulder instability and our guest speakers are Dr. Sarah Edwards and Dr. JT Tokis. Dr. Sarah Edwards was a near fellow at Columbia. She is an incredible clinician and has published on liberal tears and instability amongst other topics. She has also collected great experience as team physician of several professional teams. Dr. Yeti Tokis needs no introduction. He's one of the most productive researchers I know, has incredible insight derived from experience and I just love the way he presents. So it is great to have both Sarah and JT here tonight. For the fellows, uh, we love interaction. So please, please use the chat window. Dr. Gupta and myself will be monitoring the chat window. And if you have any questions, we will interrupt Dr. Uh, Tokis and uh, Dr. Edwards and ask him questions. This program is for you. So without any more delays, I'm going to ask Dr. Edwards to uh, share her screen and then please Sarah, feel free to start your presentation and we're very interested in what you have to tell us tonight about shoulder instability. All right, thank you so much for that nice introduction and uh, thank you for inviting us to be here tonight. Um, for all you fellows out there, we're aware that there's an important football game on right now, so it's okay if you've got one eye on us and one eye on the game. We're imagining that you're watching both. <laughs> we're on to you. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview on shoulder instability, and then Dr. Tokish is going to talk more in depth about bone defects and complex problems related to that. I'm going to present a few cases. So um, here we go. Um, maybe if I can make it go. All right. Uh, I just wanted to share these <laughs> pictures from yesterday. If any of you were watching the news, this was my my day yesterday, you can see this picture here on the left was me at noon leaving the hospital um, in San Francisco. We're having some pretty dystopian strange days right now with all of our forest fires and uh, living what we call the clockwork orange or Blade Runner life right now. Um, again, our, my goal today is to review the etiology, anatomy, basic treatment of principles of anterior instability. Dr. Tokish is going to get into complex instability with bone defects, and then I'm also going to discuss management of instability in the contact athlete, particularly those in season. And so just quickly running through the incidents, we know that uh, shoulder instability, about 24 people out of 100,000 uh, per year will have an instability event. Most dislocations occur in the 20 to 29 year range, and uh, males outnumber females three to one. The anatomy of the shoulder, we know the shoulder has a wide range of motion due to the shallow glenoid articulating with the spherical humeral head. We have the static stabilizers of the shoulder, which are the glenoid labrum, the joint capsule, the glenohumeral ligaments, and then the dynamic stabilizers, which are the rotator cuff and the periscapular muscles. The labrum uh, extends uh, the edges of the glenoid, increasing the surface area and the depth. And as you know, the capsule is intimately related with the labrum. The, and the uh, capsular thickenings create the, the glenohumeral ligaments. So it's one confluent structure. Uh, the pathology of dislocation, we know what happens to the anatomy is that they most frequently will get a Bankart lesion, which is a capsular labral avulsion of the anterior inferior glenoid. And they also get a capsular stretch injury. So you get this out pouching of your capsule, which does not return to normal after that happens. When you see a patient after their shoulder instability, you need to get a good history. So was this a specific traumatic event? Have they had numerous incomplete events? Is it generalized or do they have underlying generalized laxity? Um, you wanna know what type of instability it is. Was it a subluxation versus a complete dislocation that required um, a reduction in the emergency room? What was their mechanism of injury? Was this contact or non-contact? And was it their initial injury or has it been recurrent? On physical exam, you want to do a good uh, active and passive range of motion exam. Um, that depends on, on how acute they are and how quickly you see them. Sometimes they're, they're, it's difficult to examine them at that point because they can't move. You need to do, do a good neurovascular exam, make sure the axillary nerve is intact, and then also evaluate them from underlying ligamentous laxity and if that's an underlying problem that they have. Um, we always want to include the sulcus sign, checking at neutral and 30 degrees of external rotation. It's pathologic if they both, uh, if you see that uh, pole and that, that defect uh, just inferior to the acromion. 
when you give traction. You want to look for anterior apprehension as well as a positive relocation test. Um, you also want to check for posterior apprehension with the arm and forward flexion and internal rotation by applying a posterior force on the shoulder. And you'll see them wince or, or have pain in that position if they have instability that way. The load and shift test is done with the patient supine on the table and you can put the arm in the uh, leg cocking position and then you gently apply both the posterior and anterior force on the shoulder. You can feel the arm sublux. Try not to dislocate them when you do that. And again, in an acute exam, it's difficult to do. We know the natural history uh, of shoulder instability really depends on the age that it happens and the activity level. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different ages quickly and what to expect. Um, what we know, you know, there's been some great studies looking at this. This is a retrospective review that was done at JBGS in 2008, looking at 227 patients. All of these had non-surgical management. And if they were over the age of 30 at the time of their initial dislocation, the recurrence rate was 27%. Under the age of 23, the recurrence rate was um, 72%. So that, that inverted there. Um, and just touching on the older patients, again, approximately 20% of shoulder instability occurs in patients over 60 years old. The recurrent instability rate is much rare in these patients. Less than 10% will have a recurrent event. So you're going to treat these patients differently. You need to think about them differently. Older patients are more likely than younger to sustain injuries to their rotator cuff, their axillary nerve, or their brachial plexus at the time of the dislocation. And so you need to evaluate them closely for a rotator cuff tear. Um, I have a short fuse for ordering an MRI on these patients to and check the integrity of the cuff. They also are more likely to develop a fracture when they, when they dislocate. So you're looking for those greater tuberosity uh, or um, a three-part uh, proximal humerus fracture at the same time. So you need to be aware of that. One of the fun things of doing the Columbia Fellowship is when you're the fellow, you get called in for every shoulder dislocation to the ER uh, to evaluate to make sure they don't have a fracture. So that was, that was a fun part of that year, going in for every, every shoulder dislocation. Um, also in the terrible, or I'm sorry, in the older patient, you're going to look for a terrible triad. So they will often get a shoulder dislocation, rotator cuff tear, and brachial plexus injury. Uh, these, are, these are tough problems to treat, but the results of an early rotator cuff repair does show to be beneficial in those patients when that happens. Um, again, looking at, now shifting more to the younger population. So what they found is when you treated these younger patients non-operatively, if they were under the age of 20, a very, very high to recur of recurrence, somewhere 87 to 92% are going to have a recurrence in that population. We know the natural history of shoulder instability. So shoulder osteoarthritis uh, is very common in these patients later down the road. It occurs in up to 40% of patients with recurrent instability. And we know that the number of recurrent events correlates with the development of arthritis. So, you know, that's helped change somewhat the thinking of the surgical treatment. We'll get into that. But, you know, when I was training way back when in 2000 to 2005, you know, the initial treatment was always to do conservative treatment. And these newer studies that have come out showing this natural history and how frequently have led us to um, offer surgery earlier to those younger patients. So again, for conservative treatment in these patients, there's been some debate on immobilization techniques. There was a period of time when we were putting everyone in external rotation. Uh, that's been shown not to be necessary. Uh, patients, it, it still could work. You can put them in this position. They thought it helped uh, tension the glenohumeral ligaments a bit better. Um, that was a study out of Japan, but an American study that was done after that showed that there was really no significant difference. So the patients went back to being put into a, a regular sling just for a few days. Um, our mainstay now in the United States really is arthroscopic treatment for the, that first time dislocator. The advantages is that it helps you, you know, identify other pathology quite easily, um, such as a slap tear can be treated at the same time. You decrease the surgical morbidity, so there's no takedown of the subscap, which has its um, problems. Decrease post-op pain, increase cosmesis, and it's felt to be somewhat a rapid recovery. Uh, the disadvantages, um, again, there was a steep learning curve when this technique came out. People found the knot tying to be complex, although now that that is, uh, there's, there's all the knotless anchors, so um, that's not such an issue anymore. If someone is uncomfortable tying knots, um, again, problems with the open repair, 
repairs. There was, uh, again, reported ruptures of the subscap after anterior open stabilization of 7%. And of those that had an intact subscap, they noted a high incidence of muscle atrophy and fatty infiltration. So it's not a completely benign procedure to do an open, an open um, bank heart. I, I do feel lucky that I was training in an era where we really learned how to do a, a great open bank heart. Imagine many of the fellows maybe haven't even seen one or may, maybe have not ever witnessed one. And, and I was lucky, I think, that I got both throughout my residency. It was all open my first two years and then the arthroscopic started creeping in. So by the time I was a third and fourth year, we were doing most of them arthroscopically. So it's nice to get to see both. Um, this uh, randomized prospective study, again, looking at the debate versus an arthroscopic versus an open um, for recurrent shoulder instability showed that the groups had similar outcomes and scores and rate of recurrence at a short-term follow-up, a two-year follow-up. Um, there's been multiple studies, again, reporting excellent results for open repair. The recurrence is 5% or less. Um, the first generation arthroscopic repair techniques resulted in a very, in a much less reliable rate of success. So the recurrence was 15 to 33%. Um, and as the suture anchors have developed, the success rate went higher and it's been reported as high as 90 to 96%. And it's really changed the way we do the surgery. So 90% of surgeons now prefer arthroscopic repair as the initial procedure of choice. Again, it, and that's pending all the bone is uh, intact and JT is gonna talk about that a little bit. So as longer term follow-up studies been done on the arthroscopic repair, we're maybe not as good as we thought we were, right? So the, re the recurrent dislocation rate has been shown to be um, somewhere at 14% when you follow people out. This was a great study done by uh, Brett Owens looking at a 11 year follow-up. And they had a little bit higher recurrence. And what we've learned from that is that um, there were several issues that were a problem. So um, they found that patients that were treated with less suture anchors uh, than more, so with two or less suture anchors had a much higher rate of dislocation than patients that were treated with three to four anchors. So maybe we weren't tensioning them enough or fixing them um, as strongly as we thought we were. And the higher rate of recurrence has also been shown in contact athletes, as well as patients with significant bony defects, uh, such as an engaging hill sacs or glenoid wear or a fracture, an acute fracture. So in contact athletes, recurrence rate of 89% um, was noted in patients if they had a bony defect at the same time. So if they had a glenoid rim fracture or defect greater than 20 to 30%, uh, they were shown to have a pretty high recurrence rate. So that's someone you want to be careful with. And then the other big debate really in these athletes is when should we operate? So this is um, something that is still very controversial. And I imagine everyone on the panel has a different answer for this. But, um, you know, the recurrence rate we know is as high as 92 to 95 percent if we treat them non-operatively and particularly those with large bone defects, they have the highest rate of recurrence. So when is the appropriate time to offer surgery and to do surgery for these, these guys in season, the football players? Um, well, we know that pathologic lesions are more readily identified on an MRI correlating with the number of instability events. So this, show, this study was great because it showed, you know, the more times they came out, the more damage that was done, which we always suspected, but it actually proved it in this paper. And um, so, you know, that's something that's helped sway my opinion. Um, so the more recent evidence supports offering young patients under the age of 22 with a first time dislocation um, that they should be offered surgery. And again, if you do that surgery on them, a randomized prospective study showed that by, by doing that primary arthroscopic bank heart after the initial dislocation, you reduce the risk of prior events by 82%. So we're actually doing something pretty impactful and helpful by offering them surgery and, and getting to it right away. Um, that doesn't always happen. Uh, the other issue, again, is that long-term risk of OA. So osteoarthritis is a known outcome of shoulder instability. Um, we know that the more times that they dislocate or sublux, the higher risk of OA that we see. Um, we also know that male patients with the glenoid bone deficit were at an increased risk of pro progression of their OA changes. So if you think about the shoulder as being somewhat analogous to an ACL, um, and, and again, 
why do we operate on ACLs, you know, acutely? Because we're trying to stop recurrent instability. We're trying to stop maybe the development of arthritis, although we know that we don't necessarily do that. But I think about the shoulder in the same way, although we don't load it, obviously, the same way as the knee. But if we um, want to stop recurrent instability and we want to uh, potentially decrease the risk of further damage to the knee, further damage to the labrum, or further damage to the shoulder, excuse me, and also prevent the development of arthritis, we know that fixing them sooner rather than later um, does that. So, so I'm pro, we could talk about it as a panel, but I'm pro offering surgery to a first time dislocator that's a young person. I imagine most people in this group are, but we'll, we'll see. Hey, Sarah, um, do you mind if I jump in here one please second? Do. Please so do. One, of the, one of the interesting parts, I, 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 the reason I come in, this is JT here, but I, I would say that we got together a Delphi panel with uh, the near circle of the ASES, which uh, started last year. And the first year, uh, Jed Kuhn and I were charged with coming up with trying to answer that question. In other words, we were supposed to get consensus from all the members of the near circle as to when we should operate on a first-time dislocator. So very pertinent to the question you're just asking, right? So we asked uh, all 89 members and we put them through this entire Delphi process, which was, you know, it ended up with 162 different scenarios that everybody had to weigh in. Joaquin will remember having to fill out all of the questions and everything else on this thing. And this is what we found because when we started it, there were several members, very senior members of ASCS, presidential line people who said, listen, the reason we got to do this is because we have to educate our colleagues that we need to be operating on this first time dislocator. And, and many of us in the group sort of agreed with that. But the problem was is that we were tasked not to make consensus, but to find consensus. And, and what we found was, was that we didn't agree very well as a near circle. In fact, if you wanted to get consensus where 90% of the near circle agreed on operating on a first time dislocator, it was only in six of the 160 scenarios. It was only when you had a patient who was not in season, who had bone loss and who had apprehension. If you, had, if you wanted consensus of people that did not saying, in other words, we get 90% agreement that they would say, we will not operate on this person. It had to be the opposite, non-athlete, no bone loss, no apprehension and in season. So at the end of the day, we really thought we would come up with a, 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 a sort of a, a blanket opinion from this near circle of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society that we should be much more aggressive about operating on all these patients. And what we found was, is we are terrible at getting consensus on that. So I just throw that out for the group of fellows to consider as they uh, as they begin this whole decision making process in their own practices. I think I think too, you know, the reality when you're taking care of these teams and these high levels is that this doesn't happen, right? Like we try, we can we can. I think it's very important that you advise the athlete. Your loyalty is to the athlete, whoever you, your patient, whoever you're taking care of. But when you're in that situation, I mean, and all of us who take care of athletes know, 99% of them are going to want to play. And so, you know, it's, you don't want to box yourself into a corner saying you have to do it this way, I guess, because, you know, we, as we know, many of them choose to go back. Yeah, that's um, a great point. But I, but I do advise, I, I do think it's important to tell, tell them their options. And some, some kids don't get told their options, you know, they're like, oh, just get back in there and play. And I think they need to know that maybe, you know, surgery is a good choice, particularly if they have a bone problem. Um, so um, let's see where am I? So um, I'm going to skip this one. Hang on, <laughs> I'm skipping this one. Uh, anyway, so yes, yeah, so in C2A data again, the highest rated um, rates of shoulder instability are in contact athletes, such as football, wrestling, and hockey. Those are the sports you're going to see it the most commonly, or most common. And in 45% of those events, more than 10 days were lost out of their sport. Um, again, young males are your greatest risk and also the greatest risk of developing recurrent instability. Those are your patients you're going to see it in. You're going to see a high incidence of bank heart lesions, 97%. 90% will have a, a corresponding Hill Sachs lesion in that population. Does anyone know what that place is? Anyone? I, don't know you, I guess the fellows can't talk. But anyway, that's my alma mater. That's the University of Illinois where I went to undergrad. It was recently named number one party school in the country. So I guess that's <laughs> not something to really be, really be proud of. But I, I, there's also these amazing alumni of Illinois. So Larry Ellison and the guy who invented uh, you know, Netflix and PayPal and Yelp and the Tesla battery are all Illinois grads as my, and myself. But the reason I'm talking about Illinois is that um, 
you know, this, this was our football coach about four years ago um, at the University of Illinois. His name is Tim Beckman. And he was fired about three years ago. And the headline was he was making football players play with labral tears in their shoulder. And that was the reason they used to fire the coach. Jeez. So it's again, something, something for us to be aware of that, that this um, information is out there and being reported by the media. But yeah, and I was thinking, oh, that 14 doctor and the guy, because I'm sure the doctor had told the, the kids what was going on. So again, our, our goals in treatment, treatment of the athletes is to get the athlete to return to competition safely and efficiently, minimize the time away from competition. We want to prevent further injury and restore their function. And so, you know, when you're in season, so my, my criteria for managing these athletes for return is when they get symmetric, pain-free range of motion, all right, when they can, they have full strength, so you know they can guard and protect themselves and their ability to perform a sport specific skill. So, you know, a lineman might be able to go back faster than a wide receiver that has to put their arms up and catching all the time. That's a harder position for them to be in. And when they have the absence of subjective or objective instability on exam. So that's when they're ready to go back. And then this is a brace that often they will wear a solely brace. And again, and, and I, I give them the talk, you know, you can have surgery, you, you don't have to have surgery, but um, you know you need to give them, I believe, as the doctor, their options and let them know the data that if you continue to play, it's probably going to come out again at some point and you're going to need surgery. Most kids will wait till the end of the season and then they'll get it done. So there's always a lot of shoulder dislocations to fix in December or early January. Um, again, so that treatment, brief period of shoulder immobilization, three, three to five days, um, early rehab to achieve pain-free range of motion, and then get them back to sport. Usually within seven to, seven to 21 days, you can get them back. So it's much faster. A lot of, a lot of people think, oh, I've got to be in a sling for a month. They're always surprised when maybe you can get, you're kind of the hero if you do get them back quickly within, within a week or two. Um, so uh, if they choose early surgical stabilization, that removes the athlete from the competitive season. Um, they do get that definitive management and then their unrestricted return is going to be about six to nine months. So that's how you can advise them. That's their time going to be out. Um, again, the decision made for in-season surgery typically is following failure of non-surgical management, including rehab, bracing, activity modification. So if the non-surgical management fails, then you take them in. Um, so, and again, the current thinking and it's acceptable of treatment of athletes who have you know, anterior instability during the season, it's allowed to attempt to return to com competition. Um, it, it's acceptable. It's not, you know, considered abnormal to do that. So my take home points before we switch over to JT, again, arthroscopic repair is now preferred as uh, the first time surgery by most surgeons in the United States in a straightforward bank heart without significant bone loss. Uh, the long-term recurrence rates following arthroscopic repair are concerning, and we would advise you to use at least three anchors. I'm not being paid by the implant companies. I'm just, that's just the data. Um, young first-time dislocators are operative candidates from the first time. Um, patients with glenoid bone deficiencies are much more likely to have recurrent instability and might require a non-anatomic bony procedure. And it's currently still the standard of care to attempt to return to play in a contact athlete during season, although uh, offering them surgery is also acceptable and advised. Isara, can I interrupt for just a second? Sure, of course. So one question came through the chat by Dr. Mangon. So when you see a patient that has the first dislocation episode and you feel they may have more, do you ever tell them that one risk of getting more dislocations is that they may gain that bone loss? We would change Absolutely. the operation. Yes. So this fellow is asking you, how do you phrase that to your patients? How do you tell them, look, if you have multiple episodes, you may actually get bone loss, and now you're not looking at a arthroscopic banker, you're looking at a lateral jet procedure. So how do you phrase that? Yeah, no, I, t I tell them, I'm very honest with them. I tell them if they come out again, there, there's a risk that it can be worse and that the surgery will be more involved and they might need an open procedure versus an arthroscopic procedure. I go over the whole thing with them because I want them to be informed and then they make the decision, but I at least clear my conscience and tell them like, this is what I believe you should do. Uh, some people choose to have the surgery now. Some people want to wait till the end of the season and that's up to you. And then I, and then I don't ever put pressure on them to decide then I let them go and think about it and they'll talk to their parents and 
I'll get their parents on the phone, whoever, whoever I need to talk to, you know, I will, I will do that. But I, I do tell them that they can, they will often ask, can I make it worse if I keep playing? And the answer is yes. So it's clear. And then the other thing that I was going to ask you is knowing what you know now, if you were going to start your fellowship today, like you're in the fellowship program, what advice would you give our fellows so that they can master the technique of arthroscopic bank card? What, what do you think are the key elements where if you could tell our fellows, you know, this is what you have to learn so when you graduate, you can do a really good job technically. What would you say? Oh, that's a great question. I think there's so much on uh, just patient positioning. Pay attention to the little details, the position of the patient, the exact location of the portals. You know, your portal can kill you. You know, if you need to go posterior, you need to cheat it a little more lateral um, and get comfortable. You know, some of them are training under multiple attendings, doing lateral or, or beach chair, but pick which way they love and, and get comfortable with it. Um, I tell them to practice outside, outside of the OR, you know, to, mastering your knots, you know, and, and then obviously the more they, they master, the more they'll be allowed to do in the OR. Um, I really, even, I mean, today I was working with my fellow, uh, we did one of these in the, in the OR and, um, you know, we, I, I was teaching her, uh, how to, how to pass the suture lasso. And I was, I was having, I have them line up their putt, I call it. So, so they're like a, like a little chip shot and have them practice taking the bite of capsule and labrum before they do it. So I'm like, just show me. And Bill Levine taught me that. He was my fellowship director. So I do the same thing with them. I, I lined it up and I said, now show me how you're going to do it and then do it. So she's getting kind of two. It's like when you're taking a golf swing, you'll take your practice swing first and then your, your real swing. So she's at least getting that motion twice. I know you have more content, Sarah, but more questions mm -hmm. are coming up. Is it okay if I ask you questions by your fellows? Sure. So Dr. Kohan is wondering if you get advanced imaging a first time dislocator. Do you get an MRI oh, um, after the first dislocation it episode? It depends. So um, if they have weakness on exam, I do. So normally normally I'll see a patient. So if it's, um, you know, let's say it depends on the age too. So and if we're going to talk about surgery. So I, I give the surgery talk, you know, if they're young. And if they are interested in that, we'll get, I'll go ahead and order an MRI just so I can see it. If it's a 35 year old who says, oh, I don't really want to have surgery, there's no way. And I test their strength and it's symmetric throughout and their x-ray looks okay, then I usually don't get an MRI. And then the older patient, I'm very quick to get an MRI because I'm worried about a rotator cuff, so. How old for you, JT? Like in the patient where you are not thinking of a cafter, just a classic yeah. 35 year old with a first time dislocation, do you get advanced image or are you okay with just playing x-ray on your exam? Mm -hmm. No, I feel strongly I get an MRI on everybody uh, for the dislocation, and uh, there's there's several reasons for that. One is that uh, there are uh, cuff tears even in young patients sometimes. Uh, sometimes the x-rays will not show you some of the bone uh, loss that is present. Um, one of the interesting parts is, is I might um, throw and refer the fellows to a study by Dickens that was published last year that looks at the amount of bone loss after a first-time dislocation versus a subsequent dislocation, and, and what they found was, was that the first First time dislocators, it was roughly around 7% or so, so maybe not bad, but not zero. And then importantly, after a recurrent dislocation, that bone loss went up to about 22%. Now that's not necessarily, that was 22% total volume, but 22%. So I would say if I'm, when, and I'll manage patients and allow them to play after first time dislocation as well, depending on the talk that Sarah so elegantly laid out. But if they do it, I get an MRI after each, uh, each subsequent event, because as bone loss increases, is I get very nervous about letting them to continue to play because as you say, the operation and the outcomes change. A uh, question came from by Dr. Michael Torchia. Uh, do you guys use the AISIS score that Dr. Wallow popularized to decide between open and arthroscopic? So maybe JT, I know you have done a lot of research on that. You yep. can ask that question. So what's, yeah. what's, what's the current decision making about ISIS in 2020, what do you think? I do have that in my talk, so I'll throw that uh, in there. So we'll, but, but the short answer to the question is I do use it. It's been shown to be valid in several European studies and shown in one American study to be not valid. So there's a big difference between how you might approach all of these questions, depending on which side of the pond you're on. And I, I think that makes this a, a completely fascinating discussion. Just a quick uh, time check, so it's 8.30, we're midway into the uh, webinar, do you guys want to switch the screens or do you have more content, Sarah? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Perfect. Go on. So maybe Sarah, 
I actually think Sarah's stuff's better than mine. She should continue, <laughs> and I'll just listen and watch for the rest of the deal. That was awesome. Yeah, you did a great job, Sarah. Maybe while JT is loading up, you mentioned something important, which is that fellows today don't oftentimes see an open banker. Do you have an indication for an open banker today? Like, how many have you done in the last three years? Is there any patients that you do it or are I, you 100%? I rarely do. I rarely do. But I think it's nice to have that background. I guess they're doing ladder days more now, so they, they get that sense and that feel of what it's like. But um, I like that I... I trained and did did a lot of them while I was training. I saw some really great surgeons taught me their tricks, which I liked. Perfect. Dr. Biliani, Dr. Biliani, you know, did did them open and they were beautiful, right? So, so that you guys know, we have thirty five fellows listening at the time to your to your talk. So very very good interest. So I cannot wait for your talk, JD. You can go ahead anytime. You guys can see my screen, okay? Yes. Okay. Well, I encourage all the fellows to get a good whiskey because my talks are way more interesting the more whiskey you drink. So please co uh, consider that. Uh, I want to thank the ASES and, and Bill and uh, all of you, Joaquin, for uh, having us, Ranjan. Um, it's, a, it's an honor. And I've been a part of a few of these. And I'm actually, I tune in when I'm not faculty. I really think that what you guys are building in this uh, core curriculum, as well as the fellows stuff through COVID, and I hope it continues on because I, I really, I learn a ton from uh, these discussions. So I applaud those of you that are on tonight. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, bone loss and instability surgery. I I'm, I have a confession to make. I, instability surgery is my favorite thing to do, but it's also probably the most humbling thing uh, that I've been a part of in, in orthopedics. Uh, you, you have a lot of failures uh, when you do these things over the course of time and you follow your um, data long enough. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons maybe that I've learned in this regard uh, in terms of management of bone loss and instability. I do have disclosures. They're available in the course book. Shouldn't affect this. <clears throat> if you want to talk about bone loss and shoulder instability, the first paper that you might go back to is 1978 and Rowe and JBJS because he did open bank art repairs. And while we oftentimes tease that paper a little bit because the, the, the recurrence rate was the magic three and a half percent that we've been compared to ever since. Ooh, this thing is on a, a mind of its own. Um, that three and a half percent, uh, he really did a good job of trying to figure out who failed and who didn't. And, and the open bank art was really a pretty good deal. I was a fellow in 2000. And I remember asking both Charlie Rockwood and Rich Hawkins, I did my fellowship with Hawk, and asked them both, what is this about this bone loss paper that you see displayed before you? And Hawk said, well, maybe it's a problem that's seeing me, but I, I'm not seeing it. I, it's just not been an issue. And I went to Rockwood, asked the same question. He said, it's not a big deal. I, we do an open bank cart, and this bone loss thing is not a problem. Well, here's Steve Burkhart's paper, and you should read this. It is the most quoted paper in uh, shoulder instability surgery in history. And here's what they found. He and Joe DeBeer got together, did 194 patients. And this is what they found. If you do an arthroscopic bank cart with no bone loss, your results are very good, six and a half percent. If you have bone loss and they define that as an inverted pair or an engaging hill sex lesion, your, bone, your failure rate goes up by a factor of 10, 67%. And if you're a contact athlete, a football player, which is many of who we're seeing, and you do an arthroscopic bank cart when there's bone loss present, everybody's going to fail. Now that's Steve Burkhart giving that talk, and I promise you that that's as gifted an arthroscopic surgeon as the world will ever see. Now I asked him, because this is one of the questions that troubled me about this. Okay, so what did he recommend in this paper? He went right from arthroscopic bank art to what? He went to the coracoid transfer. He went to Latterge. That's what he recommended. It bothered me for 15 years, but I got to know Steve over the years, and, and I went and sat down with him one time and asked him, I said, you know, why did you go from A, arthroscopy, to C, coracoid? What, why didn't you go to B, go from A to B to C, and B being the open bank art operation? Because to me, in my mind, I would have said, well, that, that makes the most sense, do an open bank art. And Pegnani and others have published on that and shown that open bank arts in moderate bone loss work very well. And, uh, you know, as Sarah mentioned, I, I also trained under a, a great open surgeon in Rich Hawkins and so felt comfortable with my, arthros or my open bank art. And here's what he said to me. He said, I did. I did open bank arts, but they failed. And, and if we take a look at the bone loss that's there and, and the bone loss papers that are out there, there's a way to make that case that he's right, that open bank carts also have a higher failure rate, but not as high as the arthroscopic issues. So if you're doing it out there, please, 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 if I make one plea to you tonight, do not be a one trick pony because the arthroscopic bank cart, and this is one of those don't ask me how I know this questions. The arthroscopic bank cart is catnip to an orthopedic surgeon. It's easy. It's slick. It's fast. And there's minimal complications. The problem is it fails. 
it fails a lot in patients with bone loss. Okay, so how much bone loss is too much? Well, this is, can be answered quantitatively or like qualitatively. This is Edgy Etoy's classic study, that lower one. He cut and did progressive osteotomies. And when he got to 21, 20 to, uh, when he got to 21% in his paper, that's when the, the shoulder became unstable. So when we talk about critical bone loss and we talk about 20 to 25%, it's this paper that we're talking about. Edgy Etoy's famous work now, 21% or so. So that's, that's kind of where it is too much. But we got uh, questioning about this because we knew 20 is too much, but I looked after a military population for 17 years and we would have these patients who would come back and fail or, or uh, with much less than that. And so we got to ask the question. And so uh, one, one of our young residents, Jimmy Shehe, uh, took the ball and ran with this. And so we looked up at what we then called subcritical bone loss. And we divided the uh, patients that came to see us in terms of quartiles. And what we found was, was that at bone loss of 13 and a half percent, your outcomes were unacceptable as measured by a WOSI. And here was the key finding, even if the patient didn't have recurrent instability. So if you came back and you had 15 to 18% of bone loss and, and you uh, felt like you were okay, you hadn't come out again, your outcome score still stunk. And it was a great humbling lesson for us that we had to pay much more attention to this lesser amount of bone loss, okay? Vicky, what, what led to the worst WOSI outcome the score in the absence of recurrent instability, do you think? Was it, it was it, the stiffness? It, apprehension. apprehension. Remember, it was a military population, so they couldn't get up into positions to fire weapons, to do pull-ups, to maintain their physical fitness. And so they, as long as they lived down here, they were okay. But getting up into that abducted, externally rotated position, they just couldn't tolerate it. It was a great lesson for us. Now, since then, I tell you, this paper would not be published today because we only looked at bone loss on one side of the joint. We looked at it on the glenoid bone loss. And that's because it's easy. It's easier to measure glenoid bone loss. But other people have said, no, no, it's very important. And I'd call your attention to this, which is the most quoted instability paper in the last decade by Giovanni DiGiacomo, Edgy Toy, and Steve Burkhart. And what they said was, was that it's not enough for us to look at bone loss in the glenoid because it interacts with the other side. And that is bone loss on the humeral side. So bipolar bone loss is a real thing. The bigger the bone loss on one side, the bigger the, the effect is on the overall situation. So think of it as a bike tire going over a, uh, a pothole. If your bike tire is a massive fatty and you got a tiny little pothole, you won't even feel it when you go over it. But if you got a skinny, if you're wearing slicks and you go over a big pothole, you're falling into it. And that's the relationship that we have to learn. So of course, the question is, is well, what is that relationship and how much uh, bone loss matters and how do we figure out whether it's important or not and so Burkhart again is really funny to listen to because some people have complained that uh, that they don't like the calculus of figuring out the on-track method and then Steve who's an engineer by background says look it's not it's not even barely arithmetic you got to do one math equation so here's what they do number one you got to draw a perfect circle on this uh on this uh, uh, shoulder here. And most of us are comfortable with that. And then that yellow line is a diameter and you go across that, that's big D, okay? Then you, this here's, here's where the math comes in. We have to multiply big D by, um, by um, 0.83. That's the one math you gotta do. So in this case, the diameter, the blue circle, that yellow line is 30 millimeters long. 0.83 times 30 is 25, 25 millimeters. So that's your glenoid track. Then you have to subtract bone loss from it. That's this line. And that's six millimeters. So in this case, the patient's glenoid track is 25 minus six or 19 millimeters. Okay, then that's what your glenoid track is. So that's your bike tire. Now you got to figure out how big your pothole is. And that's what you do here. Now, I think they could have simplified this in the original thing, but simply draw a line from the edge of the cuff insertion to the medial most aspect on your humerus. And that is your hill sacs defect. In this case, it's 15 millimeters. So the hill sacs is 15, the glenoid track is 19. And therefore this patient is quote on track. If the hill sacs would have been bigger, it would have been off track. So then the question is, well, who cares? Well, we got interested in this as well, went back and looked at our uh, group of instability patients. And what we found was this. If you were an on-track person and we did a uh, arthroscopic bank cart, we had an 8% failure, pretty acceptable. But if you were off track, we, we had a 75% failure in patients with an arthroscopic bank cart. Now that was again, unfortunately, regardless of whether they had recurrent instability. So the three out of four of our patients had a poor outcome with an arthroscopic bank cart, even if they didn't redislocate. It's, it's terrible. 
So this really forced us to really think about uh, bone loss and sort of this uh, in how we do this. The scope bank card is ineffective in off-track lesions. And for the fellows, and maybe even for some of us, it's really difficult because you get into that scope and you look and you say, I can finish this arthroscopic bank card, make it look beautiful today in 20 minutes. And if I decide I'm going to open this or do a ladder J, I got to switch positions. I got to, ugh, take, it's worth it. Do it. Because in 18 months, they're going to be coming back to you when they fail it. So if you fix, how, how do you fix? Well, there's several algorithms out there. There A number of them have been published now. If your glenoid bone loss is less than 13.5% and you're on track, well, then a scope bank art's pretty good. If your glenoid bone loss is low, but you have a, you're off track and you have a, let's call it a, a large hill sacs lesion, then this is where I think a remplissage is really a benefit. And if you have greater than what Etoy called critical bone loss, so large amounts of granite bone, then I think this is where we got to get into other bone replacing procedures. And then there's a whole talk we can talk about whether that's uh, ladder J or distal tibia or distal clavicle or any of those. Um, this is an example of, of, a, of a knotless technique for uh, remplissage. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because um, it's uh, published out there and you guys, many of you have seen this. I like this one because it doesn't require me to pass sutures. It's portal I never have to go into the subacromial space. I simply place two anchors in the system, uh, one at the back of the hill sacs lesion and one at the very front of the hill sacs lesion, as you can see here. Using a small switching stick, I've made those passes separate. You can either do this with knotless or knotless anchors. Uh, in this case, it was knotted. Um, and so I pass and tie one limb together and use a double pulley technique and you can slam this down. Okay, the ideal solution of addressing bone loss, we want to restore anatomy. It's hard to put, be what God put in there in the first place. We wanted osteochondral, right? So glenoid bone loss is kind of a misnomer because it's always, it usually uh, con, uh, consists of some cartilage loss as well. So it really is glenoid osteochondral loss. And if we're only replacing bone, we worry about arthritis down the road. We'd like it to be autographed. There's no bone like your own bone. And lots of studies show that there's infection and resorption that's at higher rates with, uh, with allografts. It should be log logistically easy. It should cost very minimal or less than nothing, as cheap as possible, and should limit boner donor site morbidity, if you will. It shouldn't leave a mark. We thought about this and thought that one of the ideal positions potentially is a distal clavicle autograft. Um, we like this because it's osteochondral. It's readily available. It's cheap. It's minimally morbid, if you will. Uh, but it doesn't have a sling effect. And now, so if you believe in the distal tibia, which I do, I think it's a great graph from Matt Preventure and Tony Romeo and their group. Um, none of those graphs have a sling effect. So now the question is, is well, the great advantage of the ladder J, which is a wonderful operation, but we'll talk a little bit about the downsides, is that it has this sling effect, right? So if you take a look at the data, though, that's being questioned as to whether the sling effect matters clinically. Biomechanical papers certainly cause that say that it does. Giles looked at this with George Athwal's excellent work and showed it that if he, if he did not load ladder Js, they dislocated. And if you were unloaded, um, uh, they dislocated, but if you were loaded, in other words, you tension that uh, sling effect, they didn't dislocate in the lab. And Yamamoto showed that at end range, the sling was three-fourths responsible for the stability of the shoulder at end range of motion. Really important. A little less at the uh, down load areas, but still 50-50 in mid-range. But the clinical results of this have shown, for example, both Rachel Frank with the distal tibial allograft procedure, as well as Philip Marauder, who won the NEAR award last year, found that, uh, that bone grafting procedures without sling effects did just as well from a clinical standpoint. And if we don't need the sling effect, then maybe we don't need to go mess with the plexus and we don't need to mess with the morbidity issues that go along with the so-called 25% complication rate with ladder J. So this is actually my current technique, and uh, we'll skip through it, but I'll do a, I'll use uh, suture buttons. I think that you can restore the Glen loss. This, this happens to be a distal tibial allograft on one of mine. It allows safe, reproducible restoration of osteochondral loss, but you should, uh, importantly, know more than one technique as you go forward, because if you don't, there are times when each of these is incredibly critical to be able to pull out of your uh, armamentarium. So my encouragement to you is go learn how to do a good arthroscopic bank card, learn how to do an open bank art, learn how to do a ladder J. And then if you want to get into some of these other techniques where we're using suture buttons and those kinds of things, I think it's uh, very critical for us to learn that. Remember that bone loss is a bipolar problem and we have to take it very seriously. If you don't, uh, uh, if you don't manage it, it's going to come back and bite you. You should attack the anatomy and remember that outcome is more than recurrence rate. So I think with that, we may move on here and if there's questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great presentation. I don't know if Ranjan has any questions for you or Sarah. So guys, thank you for that uh, amazing session. So 
John, I, I have a question for, for you about the bone loss. There. What is your algorithm of how you, when you have that bone loss, of which technique you're going to do? So have you moved entirely away from ladder J's or, you, or have you moved in, entirely towards the non-biological part? And the reason why I ask is the, the addition of the ladder J is a vascularized bone graft. The other two ones that you have, even though they also don't have, yes, they don't have a sling effect and maybe we don't need it, but what about the reabsorption for those two other asp other techniques? And yeah. I was curious as to as to as to your thoughts about that. Yeah, great question. Uh, and I think the jury is a little bit out. Uh, the challenge with the latter J is that we have Gilles Walsh in France, who's done over two thousand of them, and his failure rate is like two percent. And that's going to be hard for anybody to duplicate, or certainly not. You're not going to beat it. Right. So, yep. so that's, if, if Walsh were here tonight, he would say, why are you doing, why are you accepting six and a half percent, seven percent? This is a, a problem that we have solved. And, and he does a beautiful ladder J operation. The challenge with, I think with it is, is I don't think it's, it's, first of all, if you take a look at uh, money, other confirmatory studies that are outside of him, right? We want us any technique that we do to be externally valid. It has to be able to be reproducible. When we look outside of that, JP Warner and others have published on significant significant complications rate. Even Bob Arciero, who is a open surgery genius, published 19% redislocation rate and overall complication rates of 20% with a ladder J. And that's in Bob's hands. And when JP Warner looked at this, they looked at neurologic issues. And as you guys know, won the NEAR award for an incredibly high rate of SSCP monitoring where they got nerve alerts during surgery. And 8% of those patients woke up with a nerve deficit. So if you, so that, how many of those do you need? I've got a buddy who's a partner of mine who operates on a lot of high level wrestlers, did a great job on a ladder J patient woke up and couldn't flex their arm. Can you imagine, right? You, you lose a musculotaneous nerve. It only takes one of those. So I think the, the ladder J, especially the arthroscopic ladder J, which has a huge learning curve, I think is going to be very difficult to adapt. We want something to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. The problem with the other bone graft techniques is that usually all of them that require a screw, you, it's not going to be doable. Now, Ivan Wong has a technique that's genius, but he has to put his portal over here, the portal of Halifax, in order to get the angle through your chest muscle. That's it's not going to be a, it's hard. If you come in from the back, for example, if you can see my hand here, you can come in pretty parallel from the back. But as you guys know, from the front, you're coming in no matter what you do at a 30 degree, 40 degree angle, unless you go medial to the conjoint. But Pascal Boileau just changed all that because he uh, got FDA approval for a suture button construct. Right, so we won't talk about company names, but if you if you Google Pascal, he's got a beautiful technique using a suture button construct where he does his arthroscopic bristow using a flexible button construct. So the technique I just showed you, or the, the end result of that, is a suture button construct as well. Suture buttons are flexible, and therefore you can do a bony technique through the same portals you and I use every day for an arthroscopic bank heart. Now we have to wait for some longer term follow up, but if this proves true, and I believe it will, then I believe that the ready. I'm going to say something sacrilege here, so sorry, Joaquin. I believe that the latter J will become an obsolete procedure in the next five years as people get this technique down. It's simple, it's safe, it just, and it works just as well, at least based upon the early stuff. And as far as bone resorption goes, since you asked the question, remember, Di Giacomo published that 57% of latter J's disappear and go away as well. And then you're left with a screw. Really tricky because then you've got that screw that's uncovered by bone. So I think that we are always working to get better. And I think that arthroscopy, no screws or no hardware if we can help it, and never having to go medial into the sort of, we always call the coracoid the safe side on this side and the suicide on this side. We don't want to go into the suicide. So we'd rather stay out here. This technique allows you to do that. Hey, JT, two of our fellows have questions, if you don't mind. One of them I think you answered. So Dr. Gates what, wants to know what is the perfect scenario for an open bankard in your practice today, which Sal already mentioned, and I think you did, but he's asking again, so when do you do an open bankard today, like this year? Will you do any yeah. and when? Yes. Yeah, you ready? I, contact athlete with no bone loss. So, so I, this is, I mean, the truth of the matter is, now maybe if I get a first-time dislocator, I, I can talk myself into just an arthroscopic bank card. But if you have an, a, a, a contact athlete, there have been six studies in the literature now and that are comparative. The best one's probably Cho's study. 25% recurrence rate with an arthroscopic bank cart, 12% with an open in a contact athlete population. There's no study that I know of that shows better results of an arthroscopic bank cart versus an open. 
There are some studies that are equivalent, but the majority of studies show that the open bank card is better. So if I'm doing a contact athlete, you got to have a reason why I'm going to do that all through the scope. Now, the one problem with that is, is what about the rim plissage? So now that we've added the rim plissage, there are studies out there comparing those. I've got a case that I can sort of talk about that later if you guys want to, with, if we have time. But the rim plissage might change it. I will tell you, I was worried about the rim plissage when it came out. Why? Because it's easy and it's slick. And whenever you give us something that's easy, slick, and fast, we can't resist ourselves. And sometimes we might make a decision to do a case because it's easy and not better. And open bank hearts are hard. So I'm very, I was very, but the data is proving me wrong. The remplissage data is actually pretty good. And when you combine a remplissage with an arthroscopic technique, the outcomes actually mimic those of open surgery. So, so that's the one caveat I'd say about that. Another question for both of you from Dr. Hasselbrock. If you have a patient that has 25% bone loss on the glenoid, and you're going to do a bone block. So for salvovial allergy, I think I heard them for you, distal clavicle or tibia. Do you yeah. ever also add a remplissage? Do you ever combine remplissage with glenoid bone grafting? If they, if they have not had a prior procedure, then I often will actually just do, even if it's at 25%, I will do a primary arthroscopic bank heart with a remplissage. Okay. And, and, not and not do, do a, a, do a lateral J, do you ever combine a lateral J with a remplissage? Have you done that? Is there I any not. indications? I have JP? not. Well, that Hasselbrock guy sounds smart. So uh, that has been published in the literature, and it, it just my resident right now. So I, I uh, get to tease him a little bit. He's actually a genius. <laughs> he's 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 a genius. Anyway, that being said, uh, Latterjay with uh, with remplissage has been described in the literature. I've done it twice. Uh, I think it's very important that we convert the lesion from an off track lesion to an on track lesion. So uh, if you take a look at Peter Millet's work, Peter did Latterjays and then measured pre Latterjay and post Latterjay, and he found that many of the latter J's that he did, he did not convert them. They were still off track even after the latter J. And guess what? Those patients did not do well. He only had good and excellent results when he reversed the off-track lesion to the on-track lesion. Now, in fairness, uh, um, uh, Laurent Lafosse has published a technique with his arthroscopic latter J where he was able to restore the on-track nature after latter J in 100% of the cases that he did. So I would just tell you, look very carefully. So if it's exactly 25%, it's good. We and others have shown that um, latter J only will get up to about 28%. So if you start getting above that, I don't think you can get there. And if you have significant humeral bone loss, I would not hesitate to add a, a remplissage. Another question that came up is, when you already have measured your glenoid on track, off track, with the computer and the CT scans, do you still have to assess the shoulder arthroscopically if you're going to do an open banker? Or can you just measure and say, you know, this is a, a lateral J, I'm just going to go open. So what's the value of arthroscopy when you already know you're doing a lateral J? You asking me? Both of you. Go ahead. Go first, huh? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I, if I'm going to do a ladder J or I'm going to do an open bone block procedure, and that's becoming less and less because I'm doing them arthroscopically. But if I'm going to do that open procedure, I do not tend to put the scope in. You can make an argument that there's slap tears and posterior instabilities and and 360 lesions, etc. And I think that is a, a fair comment. But I think the MRI is good enough for us to tell if I've got something in there. I think MRI is good enough now where I don't think I'm going to be overly surprised at least not to the point where I think I need to routinely scope everyone. And, uh, I, do, I, I, I do this. I don't, if I'm planning on an open procedure, then I will not scope it first. Okay. Very so good. next question, um, there is a question from Dr. Oscar is that if over 50% of the grafts reabsorbed in the latter J study, <clears throat> but didn't, but didn't all uh, re-dislocate, wouldn't it mean that the sling effect is a very important factor? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking it. I'd ask you not to tune in next time and ask such hard questions. <laughs> okay. um, that's a, that's a great question. Smart fellow, so you guys can see, huh? Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> so, uh, fair point. Uh, the other uh, the other option is is that maybe that the bone resorption is as a result of Wolf's law, and that where the bone blocks that remember twenty five percent bone loss is six millimeters. 
right? And, and, the, and the latter shade is 25 long by like 15 wide. So it may be, and it, usually it happens in the superior half of that latter shade, right? So it may be that the, that the bone resorption is just that the, the glenoid somehow knows how to right size it. And because we don't load that bone, just like Wolf's Law, that bone goes away. So it could be that the, that the sling effect is so important, but it could also be that it's just that the bottom bone that we replaced is enough. I think it's a great answer. You know, we, we discussed this in my research group at, at, in conference the other day. And, you know, I was talking about almost like the remplissage, like what if we just transfer the conjoint tendon into, and, and didn't put a bone, you know, we have so many problems with the bone resorption, the screws protruding, all these issues with ladder shade that we see, the complications that are there. What if we just transferred the soft tissue into the defect and had the sling, you know, without that? anchored it with suture anchors. I don't know if anyone's done that, but they have. Uh, and, and they it, work? <laughs> it did. It did. It was in uh, a small series. Uh, there's one Italian paper and I'm forgetting the other guy that did it, but they definitely did that with with just transferring the conjoint tendon itself and they reported small series retrospective grade 4 or level 4 that it worked pretty well. Um, the one challenge with that though is if you don't have a bone block, you're bringing that conjoint tendon up and you are tensioning it a little tighter. So in the in the lab, for example, it worked very well in the laboratory studies, but it may be that because of a different differential tension between the bone where the sling effect is, you're tightening it up by definition by bringing it up. So Sarah, have you ever fractured your coracoid when doing a lateral J and what do you do then? Like if our fellows go into practice and they're doing a lateral J, they're all excited and then it breaks. What would right, you do? that's a great question. I've used um, suture anchors and it's happened once, thank God, but I put suture anchors then into the glenoid and, and circlaged it into place. Um, and use that as the tension. You can also, you know, thread the suit. I, lo I love your technique, actually, JT. I haven't seen that with the with the buttons that you had or the tight ropes. That's great. But I, um, I think that's really smart. But I think um, I've threaded the sutures through too. I'm trying to not use the screws anymore. So I like to put drill the holes and then thread. I do it open. I don't do it arthroscopically. But then just just put tie it down uh, using suture. Our fellows are so engaged that we only have three minutes left. And I feel terrible because you guys have great cases, but we're running out of time. Ranjan, any last minute questions, comments, or JT or Sarah? We have about two minutes before we close. Uh, JT, if you could, if, do you have an, your own technique as well as when you have the, the coracoid breaking for doing a ladder J? What else? What would, uh, do you have an alternative backup? Yeah, first of all, I think uh, uh, not all of us are Joaquim, right? When he says the fellow's all excited because I finally get to go do a ladder J, there's no excitement at all. It was pure fear for me for about 50 of them, I think. So I love that Joaquim was excited about his ladder J. I was wetting myself. So just to, <laughs> just to let get that out there, that it's a hard operation and it should give you a little bit of, of nerves. Yes, I have had a, a, a coracoid break. I tried to do an, um, one of the techniques and uh, modifications is the congruent arc technique, right? So right. this is the technique where instead of just taking the coracoid off and putting it on the glenoid, we take it and turn it sideways. The advantage of it is, is that it matches the contour pretty well but but the disadvantage is is that you're putting your screw in the first place right through this the meat of it in the second place you're putting it through here don't ask me how I know that and I put a screw through it and I split it and and I did the same thing as Sarah did I, did, I probably didn't do it as well as she did but I put in uh, suture anchors and then tied them as many times over a bone bridge as I could and it worked out well thank you everybody we are at the end of our hour Thank you for your time, your commitment to the ASES, and all the preparation you made for us tonight. We very much appreciate it. Thank you guys for having us. I, I hope it's been valuable. Um, thanks so much, Sarah, and, and for helping us get this thing together, and, and Joaquin and Ron John for having us as well. Thank you. Appreciate you guys' time. We hope to see you all next week. We'll be here again next Thursday. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.